All training curricula in medicine are changing in line with the standards set out in Excellence by Design, the GMC document, and surgery is no exception. This will be the biggest change in the way we train and assess since 2007. In this video, I want to describe the changes that are common to all the surgical curricula, no matter what your specialty. Trainees will finish training when they've reached the level expected of a day one consultant in that specialty. Training will now be truly capability based, although there'll be indicative times for the length of training in which the great majority of trainees will be expected to complete training. Trainees will be able to progress faster through training if they demonstrate the necessary capability. The Generic Professional Capability Framework describes knowledge and skills that all doctors need to acquire to be a doctor of any kind whatever specialty. Inclusion of GPCs in curricula will ensure professional development is proceeding at an appropriate pace alongside development of clinical skills. Surgical training will be arranged into three phases, each phase having a critical progression point at its end, where evidence of acquisition of capability to a level described in the curriculum is necessary for progression to the next phase or for certification. This slide shows the typical phases of training in a surgical training pathway. The purpose of phase one is to gain the competencies equivalent to those described in the core surgical curriculum or parts of the core surgical curriculum necessary to progress into the STR role. For most specialties the indicative time for phase one is two years. The purpose of phase two is to gain experience in the breadth of the specialty including the unselected emergency take. If the specialty curriculum describes special interests, there will be opportunities for early exposure to these to help trainees decide what special interests to pursue later in training. The knowledge, clinical and professional skills will be developed to that required of a day one consultant by the end of phase two, which will make those reaching the end of phase two eligible to apply to take the intercollegiate specialty exam in their specialty. But it's recognised that technical skills may develop more slowly than knowledge, clinical and professional skills, and so do not need to be at the level of a day one consultant by the end of phase two. For most specialties, the indicative time for phase two is four years. The outcome of phase three is to have gained all the capabilities necessary for safe practice as a day one consultant in this as knowledge, clinical and professional skills have been developed to the level of a day one consultant as part of the outcome for phase two. Phase three allows development of technical skills to the level of a day one consultant in the generality of the specialty, emergency care and in any special interest described by the specialty curriculum. Once these capabilities have been achieved, an ARCP6 may be awarded and a trainee can apply for CCT. Please consult your own specialty curriculum for specific details as they may differ slightly from this general overview. Through the week, a surgeon will work in a number of different areas and the trainee will need to demonstrate capability at or above the level of a day one consultant in each of these areas. These capability and practice areas are common to all surgical specialties and are managing an outpatient clinic, managing inpatients and ward rounds, emergency care, managing an operating list and multidisciplinary team working. A capability and practice covers everything a day one consultant needs to perform that part of the job and integrates knowledge, clinical, professional and technical skills into a functioning whole. Cardiothoracic surgery, paediatric surgery and plastic surgery have some additional CIPs that other specialties do not need to develop because of the different scope of work. Please see their specialty curricula if you are training in one of these specialties. When someone is at the start of training, they will need to be supervised more than someone near the end of training in each of the CIPs until no supervision is needed when the level of a day one consultant has been reached and training can end. To classify how much supervision is required in each CIP at a particular time, supervision levels will be introduced. To allocate a supervision level, ask how much supervision is needed in that area of work. This puts trainer's professional opinion at the centre of assessment. You can see there's a range from supervision level 1 which describes someone who can only observe the task and supervision level 4 indicates that someone is displaying competencies at the level of a day one consultant. Supervision level 5 is available for those very few trainees who are performing beyond the level of expected of a day one consultant in that particular aspect of the job. Supervision levels will be recommended by clinical supervisors 
who work with a trainee in each of the CIP areas on a day-to-day -day basis via an assessment called the Multiple Consultant Report, or MCR.